Okay, so I will be doing my presentation on the smart grid, uh, some of the associated technologies uh, that can be easily integrated with the smart grid, um, and kind of how we can benefit from it. So as a quick outline of what I'm going to be going over, um, first I want to talk about the current grid, um, some of the issues with it, and then talk about the smart grid and how some of these problems um, can be prevented. Um, we'll talk about you know, how it works, some of the components, the infrastructure required in implementing a procedure like this. Um, some of the additional technology that, although it's not smart grid technology, it does make sense to integrate that along with the uh, smart grid implementation. We'll talk about some of the investments that need to be made, kind of the costs of building this system. Uh, the benefits that will come from some of the savings, um, also the environmental sa uh, the environmental benefits of of making a smart grid, and then the social impacts on the actual consumers who use the electricity. So the current grid. This is a nice NASA picture of the world at night, um, lit up by our grid. Now our grid provides power for six billion customers. It provides uh, 23 and a half thousand terawatt hours per year and it has 450,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines uh, that's very significant because that could wrap around planet earth about 18 times so some of the issues with the current grid uh, i don't mean to bash on it but it is kind of a dated system um, it has an aging infrastructure um, it's really not capable of handling some of the changes in usage patterns like renewables um, and weather occurrences like a tornado or a tree falling on a transmission line. Um, there's really no way for them to kind of build a quick reaction on how to handle that situation uh, just because it is so rigid. And again, um, if a tree falls, uh, it'll take a utility a very long amount of time to actually respond to this type of occurrence. So this aging infrastructure, half of the 500 to 6,000 utility workers in the, um, the electricity generation industry are going to be eligible to retire within the next two years. Um, now, I see this as a great opportunity to kind of get some new hands in on a, on a very different grid um, that does require a lot of people to have a lot more technical knowledge although a lot of the knowledge from these workers will be lost um, but as we're moving to a new system uh, that becomes more acceptable <clears throat> speaking of aging also um, not necessarily people um, but another thing that really helps um, the grid actually tr uh, distribute power so a substation transformer will basically um, voltage, a high voltage current will come in to a substation and it will be stepped down so it can be easily used in a home. Um, the higher voltage is used to transmit electricity over longer distances. Um, so it is a very important part of this without, you know, proper regulation of voltage. Um, you know, your, you could blow fuses in your house. Uh, many various things could happen. Um, so if the average age of our, tr of our substation transformers is 40 years, looking at this graph, you s we see that um, a majority of transformer failures um, actually happen when the transformer is 13 to 24 years old. Um, and, you know, we're about 16 years past the upper limit of that range. Um, however, some are still operating after about 70 years of service, and hats off to them. Um, so the grid capacity is expected to increase about 16 percent by 2030 um, and although we do have the max capacity for that um, currently we're not always operating at maximum capacity so we would actually need a system that would be able to um, create and distribute more more electricity in smaller regions so line losses um, about 22,000 terawatt hours of electricity are produced worldwide, but only about 20,000 of these um, are consumed. Um, 
This means that about 8% of electricity is lost through transmission. Um, so what happens is um, heat is created in these lines and that is basically a waste of energy. So a 1% increase in line efficiencies would reduce total costs by about 12.5%. Note that Japan has you know, expanding support for these smart grid initiatives. Um, they got on top of it in the 1990s and threw $100 billion at it. And because of this, um, in 2012 we're seeing uh, their transmission line losses at about 5%, um, an entire percentage point below the United States uh, at about 6%, and three percentage points lower than the world average at 8%. So that is a, that is a significant drop. <clears throat> Demand response. This is another issue with the current grid. Um, so we know that people don't use the same amount of electricity throughout the day. It varies, it spikes, it dips. Um, now these reliability events are handled by operators. It's not handled by kind of this overseeing system that can prevent anything wrong from happening. Um, and when something wrong does happen, utilities are very slow to respond. Um, this is because the grid is centralized, um, meaning that there are these hubs of electricity generation um, that are very distant from the people who are using them. So if a problem happens really far away, um, you could still be affected by that. And really, the main problem with this uh, response issue is that there's really one-way communication. And once we get into the smart grid, you'll understand why one-way communication is such a detriment to the current system we use. So we'll look at the U.S. grid. It's broken up into three pieces. The Eastern Interconnection, the Western Interconnection, and the Texas Interconnection. Uh, they're large enough to uh, apparently get their own um, section of the grid. Um, and you can see all of the transmission lines on this uh, map. So this really reduces resilience, meaning that if there's a failure, um, it's going to affect more people. And it's, it's going to, you've heard of rolling blackouts. A rolling blackout is one that um, basically it happens and then it moves down the line and it affects, you know, more people down the line. So what is the solution to this? Uh, we could use what we'll talk about later are called microgrids, are basi basically take all of these interconnections and break them up into little pieces, um, but they will still be dependent on each other. Um, and then distributed power. This is um, on-site generation. Uh, you think of this as maybe a solar panel on your roof, a uh, wind turbine on top of a commercial building, and so on. Um, so there are all of these problems with the centralized grid and uh, all of the aging components of the grid. But how does this really affect me? You know, I, I go home, I plug in my phone, and I expect it to charge. So, okay, um, it seems like we're experiencing some technical difficulties right now. Um, uh, I haven't heard anything from the power company, um, so I don't really have much to assume. So let's go ahead and try and get some light in here anyways. Um, so what we're experience, experiencing right now is actually a blackout. Um, and, you know, you've, you've definitely been through a blackout, had, you know, a storm knock down a power line, and, you know, you, you miss all of your favorite shows on TV. Um, you can't charge your phone. But let's take a look into kind of the history of these blackouts. So in 1965, there was a blackout in northeastern United States uh, in southern Canada that affected 30 million people and it lasted for over 13 hours. Um, I don't know about anyone in this class, but I've never experienced a blackout that was more than, you know, maybe a couple hours. Uh, so this is very significant. Um, so one uh, funny thing about this is that it was caused by one component going bad, one relay in a line in the Cleveland area triggered a series of sequential overloads down the line through Canada and around into New York. Um, so as we can see, this decentralized grid really prevents um, operators from kind of stopping it at the source, it, mainly because they don't know where the source is. 38 years later, um, pretty much in the same area, um, we see that there's a blackout in 2003 that affects 50 million people. 
and there are outages for four days to a week. Um, so significantly longer, um, and the total cost of this is four to ten million dollars, and that's from um, electricity being pushed through, that's from uh, repair costs. So basically what happens when there's a blackout, between the time that uh, there's, a, there's an overload and the time that power is restored, or power the power generation company shuts off power, um, they're still pumping electricity into the grid, and it's kind of just going to waste. Um, so that's another that's another kind of environmental impact of having an outdated system. You're you're burning coal, but you're not actually getting anything anything out of it. And what caused this was actually a software bug. Um, in the Cleveland Akron area again. So the integrity of the grid in this area had been in question for quite some time and they were confident that their software systems were um, kind of up to par with what was necessary and you know they find they find out in you know one of the worst ways possible that uh, it actually wasn't and you can see the before and after pictures how serious the lighting is these uh, pictures are about 24 hours apart um, and you can see basically whose power was shut down. Now, take this over the ocean to another place we're not so familiar with. Um, in 2012, in the summer, there was a blackout in India, and you can see um, India is a pretty big place. And this blacked out area on this map is just it's it's significantly large um, and affected over 300 million people. Um, you know six times more than the last one in, tw in 2003 in the United States and Canada. Um, there were outages for one to two days. Uh, the strange thing about this is that on one day there was a breaker flipped um, and again sequentially overload uh, the, the grid and there are rolling blackouts. They start to address the problem, they start to fix it, the next day there's a relay failure um, and it causes a very similar, you know, kind of domino effect of outages. The backups, the backup systems did not properly engage. Um, if we were working with a smart grid, um, there would be sensors in place to basically tell you if the system was not going to oper operate as designed. Um, and actually, one more thing about the blackouts in India. Um, this is a very different uh, climate. It's a very different culture. Um, so when we have a blackout in the United States, it's basically you can't use your coffee maker. But in India, it's more of kind of a life or death situation where you know it gets you know easily over 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the summer in these areas, and there's no way to cool down. And uh, although I don't have a figure for casualties from these blackouts, um, it's pretty safe to assume that there were some possibly a significant amount. Now, I really like this picture because it really explains uh, kind of what the smart grid is. Um, so it's it's a way for the utility co to communicate with the customer. Um, there's kind of all of this information that's out there that we're not utilizing, and the smart grid system is capable of almost real-time feedback on your electricity usage and then the production that's needed to actually provide you with that electricity. It allows customers to be educated on their own usage, which we'll see has a lot of good social benefits. So this two-way communication, why is it so important? Um, like I said before, this is information, this is data that's not being recorded. Um, now we know we have a problem with our usage and the way I see it is that if you have a problem the best way to start solving that problem is to collect data. Um, so if we have this kind of monitored usage um, the utilities can now maintain reliability a little better they can coordinate with the EMS systems, the energy management systems and um, control maybe the cooling or the heating of the building during peak hours so that you use less electricity and you actually save money. Um, customers, um, mainly residential, will have uh, their own kind of interface unit in their home so that they can see uh, kind of real-time uh, 
usage of electricity and as I mentioned before for like a commercial buildings EMS system um, the smart grid will actually be able to um, perform some kind of temperature control um, so if you're if we're using too much energy during a uh, peak hour uh, or a, a peak time of day then the utility company will kind of affect everybody very um, subtly um, so the temperature may if say it's the summer and you're cooling your house um, the thermostat might go up a degree um, maybe not a degree um, but rather than a blackout, I think it's a, it's a pretty good alternative, uh, maybe just being a little bit warmer. And the same thing goes with appliances also. Um, so this demand response and dynamic pricing. So this is kind of the, the invisible um, aspect that, of the current grid that we don't really see. Um, so we don't really know how much we're paying for electricity at any point in time. We get a report from a utility company that says um, the cost of your electricity is say eight or nine cents per kilowatt hour um, but what they don't see is um, and as you, you can see where I'm pointing my mouse this is kind of like peak time of day um, where the price is really high um, and we can see you know this is kind of when people are getting off work people are going home watching television um, so being able to kind of redirect usage towards hours where it actually makes sense to, to buy energy um, can save energy and money. So some of the components of the smart grid, it's really full of sensors. So um, previously the grid was kind of just out there and we weren't collecting anything from it. It was just kind of sending mail one way. Um, so now with smart meters on people's homes, smart appliances in people's houses, um, and what's called uh, fault location, isolation, and service restoration, the grid now has a better idea of you know, what's going on. If a tree falls on a line, what line did it fall on? Um, could we possibly have like a geographic location for that incident, for that occurrence? Um, so these are all things that could be addressed. So flexible AC transmission systems, um, I talked about this a little earlier but under a different name we talked about temperature control um, so the ability to kind of affect everyone minimally is the idea of kind of uh, dropping voltage um, just a little bit and this uh, fact system uh, is actually what allows for that. Some of the some more components um, Distributed generation is basically you have a solar panel on your house or a wind turbine on a building um, or electricity storage units. We'll talk about something really cool about this later. Um, now in electricity storage units, uh, typically they'll use like a, a lead acid battery or um, they actually have uh, compressed air storage. So the energy is actually stored mechanically and I think that's really interesting. Uh, new transmission lines that are able to um, transmit electricity with lower line losses um, so that we need you know less cables to send the same amount of electricity to some place and this could include high voltage DC and then new or upgraded substations. We'll talk a little bit later about how um, the old substa substations still have a lot of valuable things that uh, that we can use and we really don't need to demolish them to, to build this smart grid. It can kind of just be like an advancement of our current uh, um, grid. Kind of think of it as an upgrade in some aspects. So smart meters. Um, this is kind of what you should be seeing on people's houses. Um, the state of Ohio is kind of far behind so uh, we don't really see too many of these but you know in the near future you definitely will. So a smart meter consists of this kind of LCD readout uh, to show you how much energy you're using or maybe how much energy you've sent to the utility company if you have a distributed generation system on your house. Um, and again, this is the, that additional information. You would um, basically say, I want a smart meter that has uh, the ability to tell me how much I'm generating. So they do have you know, kind of different levels of these meters. Um, and it allows you to basically send via Wi-Fi information to 
uh, these sensors. So this little smart meter runs on about three watts of power. Um, that's a fifth of the energy cons consumed by a 60 watt incandescent bulb, um, which costs about 24 cents per year to operate. And the lifetime rating on one of these is 15 to 20 years. So in Europe, let's see kind of the progress that they've made. So we can see that areas like Italy, Sweden, they've really kind of jumped out early into the game um, in installing these smart meters. Um, so Italy, in the year 2009, installed over 32 million meters. Um, kind of the goal for the European Union is that by 2020, they want to have 200 million electric meters, which would encompass 72 percent of consumers. Um, and something we haven't talked about, gas meters, uh, just like you have a smart electric meter, you can also have a smart gas meter. Um, it, it basically works the same way. Um, and they've seen that since the implementation in the European Union of these smart meters, there has been an average electricity savings of 3%. Um, that is a really large number, 3% savings over you know however many million people are in the European Union. Um, that's a lot of carbon reduction, um, and obviously you know it's a lot of money for people, but if we want to look at kind of the larger scientific scale, that's um, however many cars were taken off the road if you want to look at it that way. So the United States. Um, so we've installed 52 million meters um, as of the year 2013. Um, we can see that you know the state of Ohio is sitting here kind of in the 5% installation range, but there are some states like Texas um, and Arizona that um, have a majority of their residential areas, you know, they have smart meters on their houses. Um, and there are, there are actually six states. Um, so nationwide, we're kind of at about 23% um, installation overall. And this is just kind of a, a figure to show you guys how much the US government is actually pouring into this smart grid initiative. Um, so it, it is a big deal. And the government is on board with it at this time. So something that's a little closer to home, Toledo Edison, I'm sure you've all um, had some dealings with them. So meter readings for them cost about 2% of their total operating cost, which doesn't sound like much, but when you think of it, it's basically someone driving out to write down a number, or if they have a little handheld device, they'll record that number. Um, so if there were smart meters, this would all be done wirelessly. Um, this would reduce the need for fuel for fleet vehicles, um, actually purchasing fleet vehicles. Um, and if we have the smart grid, there's really no need for this. So we save on all of these uh, all of these uses that just aren't necessary. So smart appliances. Now these are things that you'll be seeing in your home. Maybe some of you already have them already. Um, so these energy management systems in your home, much like what kind of already exists in you know large commercial buildings uh, for kind of sustainability purposes, um, this EMS system can control when your refrigerator defrosts. If it's you know peak hour of the day, it's going to be really expensive to defrost your freezer. Um, so it will. It's kind of an automated process where it it uh, redirects that action to a later time where it makes more sense. Uh, the same thing with washers and dryers, dishwashers, and then we talked a little earlier about temper temperature control in your house. Um, you can see that um, <clears throat> you get a live feedback from this smart thermometer, or not, not thermometer, thermostat, um, that tells you kind of how the temperature is changing in your house um, and even how much energy you're using for it. And you can do the same thing with your refrigerator. So you, you see that you actually do have some control. You, you do have options. It's not like you're completely closed out of control of your house and it's you know going to take over your life. You, you have a lot of freedom with this process. So household appliances last almost 14 years. Um, and the prediction for this market penetration for these smart appliances is that by the year 2030, um, out of 100 uh, 
households, 38 of those households will have basically a full fleet of these smart appliances. So we talked a little earlier about fault location, isolation, and service restoration. Um, kind of a visual for this is that you think of one line, one transmission line, branching off into two different forks. Um, say that there is a, an overload on one of those, um, on, on actually the main line, on the main trans transmission line. Now, this this, this service restoration would be able to basically gate off that line and stop electricity from flowing through and overloading um, sequentially down the line so that the failures will stay more contained to the source of the fault. Um, and it'll actually send information back to you, the utilities, and it'll tell, it'll tell them um, like we talked about earlier, there is a tree that falls and they have no idea. In most cases, the first time they find out that a tree fell is that an old woman calls them on the phone and says that they don't have power. And then there's an investigation on what, what the cause of that is. But with this uh, massive system of sensors and basically re real-time feedback, um, it, really, it really helps. Um, so a Department of Energy study that studied 16.5 million customers across five utilities um, in 11 different states for almost a year uh, came up with the results that 270,000 fewer customers had interruptions that were more than five minutes long. Um, and that, that is a lot of customers. You know, this is not like a full scale um, study, but in this small area, um, what actually means more is how many minutes of interruption were um, avoided because that can be um, translated into a monetary value that can be translated into um, uh, an amount of energy. So, okay, so keeping with this study a little bit, um, from all of the interruptions that they did have, they actually went and listed um, what the cause of those outages were. Uh, so we see that about a quarter of those happened from vegetation and trees. And we'll see on the next slide um, kind of a way that a lot of these outages could actually be prevented. Um, also, um, some of the equipment failures might be included in this also. So these, these dynamic line sensors, this is a good picture. Um, these are really beneficial because they give you so much information. They tell you the temperature of the line. They tell you um, the status of the current that's going through and actually what you're losing. Um, so something interesting about transmission lines is that if you put too much current through them, um, then they'll actually start to heat up, which means you have uh, higher losses. But visually, you can see this that when you see a line sagging, when, it, when a line is sagging between two posts really low, that means it's really warm because the heat actually changes the integrity of the conductor inside. Um, so a sensor like that would be able to tell you um, an equipment failure could happen because uh, it might, might uh, a line might break soon or it might have some damage in it. Um, and they're really easy to install too. You can see in this picture that um, they really do just clip on. Um, and that's that makes you know it makes it a lot safer of a job for someone to install something like that. So let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure required to actually roll out this smart grid. So we'll look at kind of the consumer level right now. So th they would need an interface to communicate with the utilities. Um, this is an advanced metering system. Um, this would be also a communication system to um, tell consumers it's you know it's uh, peak time. Don't use energy. Um, it can tell you there's an outage in your area, um, and it can also kind of build this network of communication among the sensors as well. Um, now, cybersecurity, um, since there's so much communication here. Um, the idea that that could be intercepted is a very, very valid concern. Um, and we'll, we'll address how seriously that, that the world is taking that uh, in a little bit. And then some of the infrastructure that 
already exists, um, and there is, you know, there is the possibility that we will need to build more substations. And you know, when you build, um, when you try to decentralize the grid, that's exactly what you have to do. Um, and what we talked earlier about how it, think of it as an upgrade, um, and it's not necessarily kind of starting over from scratch. So cybersecurity. Some of the concerns are that, um, you know, you have your vehicles um, hooked up to your house. Um, there's there's a chance that um, some kind of cyber invasion could uh, compromise uh, the the safety of that vehicle. Um, there could be maybe tinkering with your smart meter and how much electricity you use and actually affecting the security of the distribution of electricity. Um, so other than telling you, you know, how much money they've put into this, it, it's, it's hard to say that, you know, this is one metric that I can tell you that improves cybersecurity. It doesn't really work that way. Um, so there are critical infrastructure protection standards in place, and they're re re approved by FERC the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and you know the whole purpose of them in the United States is to make sure that electricity is reliable that is that is what FERC does so for FERC to put a protection standard on the smart grid um, it has a lot of weight to it um, stubs, substations so we talked a little bit about how um, capacity is going to increase over the next few years um, and we can see that load growth is ex is expected to be about one percent of an increase per year until 2030 however the smart grid has the ability to reduce this to about uh, 0.68 percent um, so you know about a 32 percent difference um, per year and this really does add up over time and it equates to a 5% reduction um, compared to where we thought we would be in 2030 without the smart grid and where we anticipate ourselves to be with a smart grid and this involves uh, you know the installation of a little over 9,000 new substations if we include uh, the need and requirements for renewable energy um, so all existing substations might, I mean, you could just update them. The only reason you would need to build a substation is if um, the population of transmission lines in an area that does have a uh, fairly high usage um, just isn't adequate. And here's, here's a good picture of a substation. Most of those boxes that you see with kind of the cones sticking out, those are the transformers. Um, and that's what changes the voltage so that um, it can be handled differently, whether it's being uh, transmitted across, you know, a farm field or going from uh, a line to your home. So some of the associated technologies that aren't necessarily uh, part of the smart grid, um, but they really do make sense to implement along with the smart grid, and you'll see why. So microgrids this is basically the idea that we break up the interconnections so that they are um, still dependent on each other, but they have the ability to separate themselves and kind of isolate and um, say there is a blackout. They can kind of take a step back and just not be a part of that blackout just by separating themselves. Um, and also GIS, Geographic Information Systems. Um, HVDC is the idea that you transmit um, electricity through high voltage direct current and that helps with line losses. And then um, plug in electric vehicles. There's actually something that's really interesting about that that we'll talk about in a little bit. So the idea of the microgrid, um, as I've explained it, um, this is kind of the grid that we're operating on now. If there's a blackout here, then there's a blackout here. Now, when you decentralize it, if there's a blackout or if there's an overload, maybe at uh, this generation station, um, you know, none of these people are affected down here. Um, and that's much more beneficial because, you know, we want to keep the lights on. And then uh, something that we haven't talked about is this distributed system where you have a 
a lot of alternatives uh, to receiving electricity. Um, if, if one of your sources goes down, then you still have another. Um, if it's the daytime and your wind turbines stop spinning, then your solar panels will be able to power your house. Now GIS is a really powerful tool. I've actually been working with it a lot um, at my job at the university, um, and I'm seeing how, how useful it could be. So it allows for um, management of this geospatial information. Say we want to know where all of the sensors are in the smart grid. Um, we would be able to lay all of those data points over a map. Um, we would create a relationship um, between um, the geographic location and what uh, what all of, what all of the sensors are saying, um, and you could basically make a map that tells you you know where not to put some of these sensors. If it is um, a structural piece like a tower or something, um, you can see in these high risk areas noted in yellow, orange, and red on the map that would be you know a bad candidate for a spot to put something like that. Um, and this just really gives the utility a lot of awareness when they're actually planning a large project like this. So high voltage direct current, I don't want to get into this too much. Um, so due to um, the fact that AC power in transmission lines has, well, AC power behaves like a wave. Um, and this means that these electrons inside of the conductors are constantly and re uh, repetitively making contact with the walls of the conductor and um, it creates a lot of heat and heat is how you lose energy in a transmission line. Um, you can kind of see that the idea of high voltage is if you are transmitting electricity over a very long distance it actually makes more sense to to install with uh, high voltage direct current rather than AC. Um, because in this presentation I've talked so much about microgrids, um, they're kind of kind of opposites of each other because with a microgrid you have transmission lines traveling over much shorter distances um, and it, it makes a little less sense to use HVDC uh, because the the actual cables are very expensive. Um, so, like I said, they're kind of opposites of each other. If you have more microgrids, that means your transmissions don't need to go as far, and there's much less of a need for high voltage direct current transmission. Now, plug-in electric vehicles. Now, I never knew this about about bef about PEVs before doing this, um, but when attached to the smart grid your vehicle can act as kind of a battery or storage system for electricity for your house. So say you're not using a lot of electricity but you're hooked up to an electrical system that produces wind energy at night and it's very very cost effective and you have the ability to store this. Um, you still have to pay for it, yes, um, but it's cheaper for you to onboard that electricity um, at that time. So you can kind of um, upload a charge and then discharge um, and it, it's all an automated process also. Okay so now we're going to talk about kind of uh, some of the costs that go into uh, building a smart grid and then also comparing that with the benefits that you actually get out of it. Um, so there was a study done by the Rocky Mountain Institute. It was this very very large uh, large scale cost benefit analysis of the smart grid. Um, from this, uh, they came they came out with this figure that 17 to 24 billion dollars per year for the next 20 years needs to be invested um, into this smart grid. Um, but when you kind of compare that to um, you know a few million dollars here and there from blackouts or interruptions, you'll see that a lot of those costs actually do pay for themselves. So when the author of this study says that there's a benefit to cost ratio of you know around three to six. Um, it really shouldn't surprise you that much. So some of these investments. So what what are the costs and who do they affect? So we can see you know right away that the consumer is you know last in place for who has to pay the most money. Um, which it's actually seven to ten percent of the total investment cost. Um, 
and that you know that's that's a big concern for a lot of people but a majority of this actually comes from installing a lot of these sensors putting a lot of emphasis on cybersecurity and then energy storage whether it's in a battery or uh, if, if you're using your electric vehicle so residential areas um, the average US monthly electric bill in 2012 was $107.28 um, according to that same uh, RMI study, um, the bills on average would go up from anywhere between 8.4 to 11.8 percent um, for the next 20 years. And this equates to an extra nine dollars a month to about twelve and a half dollars per month. Um, however, these are just the costs and these don't really have the benefits weighing in. So if there is an increase in your bills, um, the benefits um, could possibly outweigh those if you're seeing a 3% electricity decrease um, then your bill may only go up by like six or seven dollars now some of these benefits okay so we want to reduce co2 emissions this is a great way to do it um, indirectly we can use uh, electric vehicles um, and that's not necessarily a, a part of the smart grid um, but we can see that if it is easier to use, then more people will um, purchase them. Um, you re actually reduce your electricity usage. You increase your efficiency of your line transmissions. And this all reduces CO2 because if you're burning coal um, and you need more energy, you have to burn more coal and you have to emit more carbon. Um, and we talked a little bit earlier about how Toledo Edison um, would be able to cut out 2% of their operation costs if they didn't have uh, you know, fleet services checking on uh, your meters and writing or logging your meter reading. Um, another benefit, you know, jobs. There is a prediction that on the high end, about 580,000 jobs were to be created from the smart grid movement by the year 2012. Um, and another benefit is that since the utilities are receiving information about um, an incident, that may have occurred if a tree fell and knocked a line down. That is now more information that they had before to tell the person that they're sending out there um, to a potentially hazardous condition uh, because they're really sending them out there blind. They, they don't know what the problem is, but they're sent, you know, to fix it. Um, and another benefit is a more informed consumer. Um, what's better than, you know, knowing that you're using way too much electricity and you need to cut down and having an actual motivation to do that. Um, and again, uh, this goes into uh, people understanding that um, it is, you know, a personal, a personal responsibility of yours to, to reduce per capita rates for, for the country. So reduce CO2 emissions. Um, between 60 to 211 million metric tons of CO2 could be avoided annually by the year 2030. So that means in the year 2030, we'll be um, producing 60 to 211 million less metric tons of CO2 in that one year. Uh, to kind of put this in, in terms that you might understand, uh, 60 to 200 million metric tons of CO2 is equivalent to um, a fleet of say 10, or 10 million Priuses um, driving 10 miles a day for seven, for 7 to 24 years. That is the range of that carbon emission. Um, and this is only true if they drive every day and they don't get vacation. Um, so this is kind of uh, the most hard-hitting part of this presentation for me because I always say that um, you know, it's in our hands to, to kind of attack this problem on an individual level. Um, I, I believe that customers who are more informed about how electricity is used in their own households, they're going to be more likely to change their own habits. Um, and, you know, knowing step-by-step -step usage allows them to um, more strategically change their wastefulness. Uh, maybe they can target a certain time of day when they know it's going to be uh, peak time for electricity, or they know that certain appliances use more energy than others, and maybe that they'd be better uh, implemented at a different time of the day. Um, and again, the world can't wait for technology to catch up. Um, it it is on it's on an individual basis that that people need to change from 
a high consumption lifestyle to a lifestyle that is sustainable. And some of my conclusions for this presentation, um, I had a lot of fun looking into all of this, um, and, I, and I hope you guys have had a lot of fun learning about it. Um, so if you, if you want to use renewable energy, if you want electric vehicles, and you want to decentralize the grid, the smart grid is the answer. The current grid can, simply cannot keep up um, with the options that the smart grid is offering and how much they could actually benefit us. We'll reduce blackouts, we'll save money, we'll save electricity, we won't be, um, you know, wasting energy by shutting lights down when we don't need to. Uh, we can contain blackouts, so this idea of a rolling blackout will kind of cease to exist. It won't, it won't travel, um, you know, from New York all the way to Ohio and through Canada. Um, these fault location systems will be able to, you know, gate those effects and kind of keep them where the problem is. And through um, through smart grid, kind of like automated distribution and possibly high voltage direct current will improve our line losses and decrease them. Um, and we can actually improve the response from utilities. Uh, so now they'll have more information to say this is where the problem is. They have a really good idea of which component um, cause that problem um, and they'll have a lot of sensors to tell them that so if they're sending someone out there they can send them out there with the right equipment um, we'll use electricity during peak hours this means that our maximum capacity won't need to increase nearly as quickly as we anticipated to and it's going to save consumers money and it's going to waste less of our resources the one thing that i want i want to get through to you guys through this presentation is that the smart grid is really a wealth of information that we really should be tapping into and using. Um, the idea of the, the idea of automation is kind of a product of that, but the birth of this idea is that mail is going one way and there's no response. And in order for for us to actually solve this energy crisis, people need to be aware of what they're doing, and the only way to do that is to actually, you know, pull information from a system. Um, so that's all I have. Um, here are my references and some more references. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to just email me um, or Dr. Kare. And thank you very much.